right. And Eva's here. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session until 6.30. I move that the Concord School Committee and the Concord Carlisle School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with CCHS tutors and CPS CCHS bus drivers union, unions, plural, and return to open session at 6.30 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Morano, I for both. Well, Sophie, I for region. Randy, I for both. And Wilson for region. All right. See you at 630. Hi. Welcome back uh, to the April 26th Joint School Committee meeting. Um, we are going to start with the CCHS update. And I see Harry and Darcy together. Hello. So We're so nice to see. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have to make like a bit of a brief appearance tonight since we do have a Senate meeting. Mm -hmm. But I have the presentation. Um, oh, hold on. Just give me one second. <laughs> having a bit of um, technical difficulty. Yeah, but it is. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I don't normally zoom from my school computer, so I'm just setting it up to screen share. Oh, got a good vacation. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good. A little break. <laughs> yeah. That you're happen. fully back into, into your activities. So yeah. Oh, here we go. Selves here tonight. All right, can you okay. guys see? Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, perfect. perfect. So yes, perfect. here's our student report. So we have a few quick updates. So obviously everyone just came off of April break. And I think a lot of students, I heard from people in the building that people were appreciating over this break specifically just check and the roles. all the breaks. And then seniors um, are- Just check them, they might need two more minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we could just wait. Yeah. No, I-, I I think it was someone in the audience who was talking to someone in their household. Oh, okay. Sorry. 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 Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah. So seniors are preparing for their AP test and a bunch have begun coming to colleges, which I think is exciting for them and a mm -hmm. bit of a relief after definitely what's been a long yeah. year. And then class government is planning a spring cleaning, which I think is always really exciting. I went to the one in the fall and they're bringing back alumni this year from the class of 2020 because they missed out on it. And then there's also like a day of silence coming up that is mm -hmm. sponsored through Spectrum Club. Which is actually going to be here tonight, I yes. think, as well, which mm -hmm. is cool. And then for Student Senate, there is a pop-up thrift store coming up, which is really, really exciting. That's mm -hmm. another big event for us. Um, and then, yeah, that one's really cool. Yeah. Um, last year, I was a part of that. And we go to drop off, swap up, and basically take um, most, most of the clothing items. We sort through them. Um, and figure out which ones are like clean and which ones people might want to buy. Um, and then last year we raised over a thousand dollars for, I believe it was a women's shelter. Um, and that, that was really cool. Um, and that's always a very yeah. successful event. Yeah. And then the rejection crane, just really quickly, people take like their rejection letters that they get from colleges and make it into a paper, like origami crane. And it just sort of just show like that everyone gets rejected from places. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a cool sort of like show of unity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, spring sports are going well. And I don't know Darcy, if you want to take the next two. Yeah. Um, and then one more thing we're doing in Senate is the destination map, which is sort of the more like a little bit more positive look um, at where seniors are going. So you always see this big map at the school. I um, mean, it's so cool to see people going um, all around the world and all around the United States, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, spring sports are going well. Um, for a lot of teams. I know a lot of um, CC teams have been pretty successful so far in the spring sports scene um, or sp spring sports season, which we love to see. So yep, go CC. And then um, we also just completed a successful spring spirit week. Um, so we had a cornhole tournament, which we have annually. Um, and that's really cool. We got food trucks. Um, we had over, we had 60 teams sign up. Yes. Um, which are pairs of two. So like 120 kids, which is pretty good. Um, Student faculty basketball, that's supposed to say. It's a bit yeah. of a typo. And then also a scavenger hunt. Mm -hmm. And we also just thought we mentioned the theater department is working really hard right now. They're in their final weeks of preparing for the spring musical, yep. 42nd Street. And that's the first like real one back. 
um, without COVID restrictions. So it'll mm -hmm. be actually in the auditorium. Yeah. So that's great. And then we just thought we'd include some pictures of Spirit Week. Here you can see the winners of, of the, the Cornhole, cornhole Tournament. tournament. Yeah. And then right next to them is some of the spectators at the student faculty basketball game. Mm -hmm. um, and then some teachers who were playing at yeah. the student faculty That event was a lot team. of fun. It was yeah. cool to see the teachers playing. I had fun. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we just have a picture of Cornhole. You can see a lot of kids stayed to the final round to watch. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been a fun couple of weeks at CC. I think the energy sort of back up again for the yeah. spring and the end of the year. So. Yeah, I think a lot of people are excited because they kind of, the warm weather is um, happening yeah. now and kind of going into the summer and uh, just leaving after the break, which is nice. Assessment with your provider. Um, a lot more people are eligible and Ben would better- If everyone could mute, please, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you, I think that's it from us. Yep, yep. Great, thank you. Thank you. So great you, to see you, and thanks for squeezing this in. Yeah. You, you, well, you mentioned the energy around the campus. Thanks for sharing a little bit with us tonight. Yeah, of yes. course. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. Um, and so we are now at our first public comment session of the evening. This one is 15 minutes, um, and we have three minutes for any speakers anyone who wants to make a comment we'll begin with people who are in person um and a new thing that we've done is we've added our protocols for public comment just to help people understand how agendas are made and, and how the meeting is organized as a link to our agenda so if there are any members of the public who'd like to speak please raise your hand nope okay do we have members of the uh, audience the zoom audience I am seeing no hands raised. If you're having trouble raising your hand, just turn on your video and we can recognize you that way too. No? Okay. Well, we have another public comment at the end of the meeting if anyone wants to join in then. Um, and so we will now move to our recognitions, the CCHS Spectrum Club. So we'll invite you up. We're fortunate enough to have both in their, one of their students and one of the advisors here in person. I see Mr. Kendall's on Zoom. I'm not sure if any of the other kids are, but if you are, feel free to turn on your cameras and we'll have you come on up to the mic. <laughs> Hi, um, we're at the Spectrum Club is delighted to, be here and say hello and thank you for acknowledging our award and it's my my name is Bila Pratt I'm one of the co-advisors and my my ride or die is on zoom Ben Kendall and Hi, um, folks. <laughs> and we're thrilled to have Alex Nugent the um, vice president of spectrum here and she was going to just show you the powerpoint that the kids made um, when they received the award and I I think Dr. Hunter you've got the powerpoint with you Oh, no, I don't have it right here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. We'll just talk amongst ourselves for a minute. <laughs> we'll act it out. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. So do you, do you, is this the slide presentation that you both brought to the uh, Yeah, with your show? beautiful photograph in it, or the, the photograph from your committee of the kids. So, so this was a, a gathering of, gosh, about 50 people, maybe mm -hmm. total, um, on a Sunday afternoon at the high school, as I recall. It was really exciting. It's also really disconcerting. This is what happens when we're on vacation before the meeting. Here we go. I guess the only question I was left with, uh, Dr. Lopret, was who was more proud of whom? Parents, students, teachers. Um, there was a lot of pride going around. A lot of pride. Yes. Pr you know, pride's a big part of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I do have it. So here, here we go. Screen share. I'm going to let Alex take it away. Just uh, this is your moment to say you knew Alex when we'll yeah. all be saying that today. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So, this is the presentation we shared um, at the awards um, ceremony to just a little bit about us and a little bit about what we do. Um, so in response to um, a report in 1992 by the Governor's Commission on Gay and Lesbian Youth, 
Um, there were, out of the 12 recommendations, one of the recommendations was the GSA, so a group of CCHS faculty members and administrators um, decided to meet and focus on the goals of both like serving the needs of kids, um, facing any possible backlash from the community, and also of training faculty. Um, so the first goal led to the formation of Spectrum, um, which was in early 1993. Um, and it was first advised by um, teachers Peter Atlas and Donna Gilbert. Um, and <laughs> the second led to PRISM, which um, was a community group, uh, it's a community group that um, responds with like letters to the editors and church talks um, to respond to any potential backlash from the community. I'm so enthralled, I forgot I'm running this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of our biggest um, objectives at CC is raising awareness. Um, so some of those pictures are from um, a walkout that we um, led in participation with a national wide effort spearheaded by Queer Youth Assemble um, to raise awareness and protest against the um, Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida and the directive in Texas um, that would pre uh, prevent trans children from getting access to healthcare. Um, another thing we do is we have these slideshows um, that are on the TVs at CCHS that showcase little bits of, like historical figures or historical events in the LGBTQ movement that not many people know about. So that's Marsha P. Johnson, who helped lead the Stonewall riots in 1969. And by we, we mean now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... Um, so I also just like sticky notes um, for safe schools was a project that um, was started by some former leaders and former club members who have since graduated. Yeah. Um, so, the, yeah. Um, so well, our next sort of big project is this Friday, um, which is the Day of Silence, which is sponsored by GLSEN, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. Um, and it's bas um, basically participating students, we're all black, and we will have this rainbow pin that um, the IBIS grant from class government, we were able to receive to pay for all of that, which was pretty awesome. Um, and so the idea is to have like as many community members and students as possible wearing all black and wearing this rainbow pin. Um, and some students are also choosing to take a vow of silence for the school day, which kind of represents the silence of um, like LGBTQ students or community members who feel like they can't be themselves at school and therefore have to feel like they are silenced. So um, yeah, and then so we also do some things like for like to create a positive culture, um, like these safe space stickers um, that all teachers uh, were distributed to all teachers to put up in their classrooms so that students there know that their teachers a resource and that their classroom is a safe place. Um, and we also did early last year, the week of the rainbow where um, like students could wear a different color every day to like also be like a public show of support for their LGBTQ peers. Dr. LaPrette perfected the, oh, you see it right there, the rainbow pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, um, as if things couldn't look more delicious. I get a certain amount of grief for my visuals. <laughs> Dr. LaPrette is colorful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and we also do fun events. Um, so in the fall, we had a Halloween dance, um, which was um, pretty awesome. And then we're also um, inviting other schools to an outdoor social in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, to invite like other GSAs from a bunch of other schools to just all get around and promote queer joy. Awesome. Um, yeah, another thing we do is we have a partnership with the Concord Middle School GSA. So um, we're like, we got together for like a Jeopardy game um, last June. And um, it was really great to sort of allow the younger kids to see like kind of their older peers and have that like relationship um, with them, which is pretty awesome. And also for us to sort of see a reflection of ourselves when we were in middle school. <laughs> so long ago. Yes. Um, yeah, and then we got the part of 
Climate for Freedom Award from the Concord Carlisle Human yeah. Rights Council. I think we were the first student group yes. to ever receive it, which was yeah. really awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Desai, you put the wrong position in there. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and those are our other two presidents, Phil Leary and Francis Davies. Um, and we're also really lucky to have a lot of supportive adults at CCHS. Um, so there have there've been like panels in the past of like LGBTQ staff members showing their support. Um, and we were also lucky to have Dr. Hunter come to one of our meetings a couple weeks ago. One, please, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, we also had some like teachers come and listen to the speeches at the walkout, which was pretty awesome. And of course, our wonderful advisors, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kendall and Dr. LaPrette, um, who are fabulous. I think that's some some past um, leadership for Halloween. Yeah, that was a Halloween dance where the, the presidents at the time dressed as dressed like, like your advisor day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, there's a, a kid sporting a wig. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sweater. Yeah, you did a great yeah. job. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you again. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for creating a safe space for the kids. It's a tough time in the world, and yes, it's a lot easier to be a kid at Concord Carlisle than at many places in the world. So, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you thank very, you. very thank much. You for doing I, I love the piece where you go to the middle school. How, many, <laughs> how long has that happened? Um, is this I new? Think oh, yes, yeah, since Alex was in middle school and facilitated it. <laughs> yeah. in ourselves. That's really great. I, yeah. I think uh, it it's, can't be more important, I think, to model that. Um, what's going on at the high school? So thank you so much. Alex, what grade are you in? I'm a sophomore. It's amazing. I know we have heard it. <laughs> <Four years. laughs> it's really great. Awesome. Really thank all everybody who's been involved, all the other students and faculty members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can, I just wanted to say, can you guys hear me? Okay. No. <laughs> yes. Yes, Ben. That's, okay. that's always that's always a problem. I know. I just I've been an advisor. I don't know how many years I've been one of the advisors uh, for Spectrum, but I I know that one of our goals for a long time was to try to. Uh, break into the middle school uh, or, or to try to, you know, to try to, to reach out to middle school students. And I know that uh, Ms. Regis has just done an amazing job down there. And so I, I think it just happened organically and I'm, I'm not taking any credit at all for any of it. So I'm just, uh, but I just think that, um, yeah, I'm just so glad that, that, uh, that Ms. Regis was recognized for her work down there. Uh, as well. And I just think it's, um, I, I just, for the longest time, I think there was a sense of, you know, let's, you know, middle school is too hard to reach out to, and it's too awkward a time for students. And uh, it just seems like it's just, it's also, as someone commented uh, on the, on the, on the school committee, it's such an important time as well. So I'm, I'm so, you know, I know that there's really uh, the teacher's my son is in the sixth grade. I know you guys are doing great work in the middle school. And so we, um, I so appreciate all we, anyway, just thank you for all the work you're doing in the middle school as well. So thank you. 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 Gonna, I'm going to sound so patronizing, but I'm going to get Alex home. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. For thank you. you. Have a good night. Congratulations. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. All right, uh, on to the reading of the minutes yes. from open session. Good. Need a motion? One, two, right? three, four. Open sessions, yeah. We have a motion. I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees approve the uh, minutes of March 10, March 22, March 31, and April 5 of 2022. Is there a second? Okay, uh, discussion. I wanna make a note about uh, the April 5th. There's a reference to a uh, quote unquote revisit. I think uh, quoting me revisiting the uh, outcome of uh, the facility uh, use policy update. Um, 
And just for clarification, by revisit, what we mean is a, a business office analysis whenever that could be conducted um, okay. with the sense that that, uh, like, uh, and many of our policies that uh, impact lots of community members, um, it, it deserves continued scrutiny. And I know, I know Mr. Stanton's well aware of that, but revisit simply means that we turn to them and uh, look for what pluses and deltas and yep. Ian's um, well aware too. Yeah, Ian Rapes. good. Yep. Thank you. Good, Bob Rubin. Yep. Not that we start that process over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you to Aaron. This there's a lot there's a lot of minutes going on. So yeah, thanks thank for staying much. on top of it. Yep. Um, and um, so with that, unless there's any other discussion comments, nope. Then uh, roll call. No, sorry, just a vote. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 All, right. All right, that passes. Um, correspondence. I'm not super sure. We had one correspondence from Boston uh, Metco from the yes, Metco Parents there was Collective. One other one I, that you responded to. I couldn't I, find it. Oh shoot! I know. Yeah, vacation threw me off, and I, didn't, I know I didn't update my. Um, I didn't do this today. Um, was, it wasn't a large volume. I would say there's one other piece of correspondence. Yeah. yeah. The, the parents collective was the big one. Yeah. Um, and I can't okay. pull it up. I'm sorry about that. The parish? Oh, because it came to it came to Concord, but it was meant yeah. for, for 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 the region. The first parish one, the one that was at the first parish. We've had was that in that? Let's see that the vacation week had thrown us off. Yes. I think it was. I think you're right. Regarding was April 14th. Yeah. I think that's it. Okay. 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 I'm gonna okay. do a better job of that. Yeah. 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 Uh, then chairs and liaisons reports. I go around. Sure. Okay. We, do you want to start? We can start together about. Um, so, Karen and I went to the meeting in Boston as we're part of the superintendent's uh, Metco Advisory Council. So, we attended that right before break on Thursday. Carrie attended by Zoom. No, it was Tuesday. Wednesday. Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Days are confusing. <laughs> Carrie attended by Zoom. I attended in person. And so, we um, just met with a group of Boston parents, and there were some Concord parents there. Um, we had all the principals. Well, not all princes. We had Naomi, Justin, uh, Mike Mastrullo in attendance, and Andrew was there, and Lori was there. So we hosted that meeting, and then we're looking to schedule another meeting in the near future. But we're working on some scheduling things right now. So, and, and the letter that we received from the Parents Collective mm -hmm. uh, spoke to some of the conversation I think mm -hmm. that, that yep. you guys had had, and, uh, and we'll definitely inform the policy subcommittee's next meeting. Yep. Which is. We're searching for a date. We're looking for a potential May 9 date. We have a, a quorum, but we want to hear from everybody. Okay. Great. Right. And we did finish our, as you all know, we all finished our DEI training. Our last yes. session was also that same day. So um, if you have any feedback for that, um, you can send it to me and I'll give it to Paula and um, Ed if you'd like to. And if we want any follow up, we can certainly look towards that. That's it for now. Thanks, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so please extend many thanks. Yes, yes. we'll do. Really quick Ed and Dr. Martin for that. Um, we'll do. Yeah, thank you. Those, the sessions flew by. They were they really, we're so engaging. Mm -hmm. Right. That was great. It's wonderful work. All right. Are there any other? Eva? Yeah. CPAP? Did you, were you able to go? I missed my first meeting. Yeah, no, there was not really much about uh, the region, uh, just the uh, CPAP stuff. Yeah, could you talk closer to the mic? Uh, so, so at the CPAP meeting, there was not, not really much about the region, just um, CPAP uh, spoke uh, to the director of special education services about the upcoming presentation clarification about upcoming presentation. So I think that that will be covered. And the, the I think the official invitations have gone out to the appreciation awards. Yes. On May, yes. May 5th. Mm -hmm. Great. I was brief update. I didn't actually attend select board because I was in Carlisle at the town meeting, but I got an update from Terry Ackerman 
uh, they voted unanimous, unanimous support for uh, Article 18, um, affirmative action. Uh, and they thank both committees for working together. And they do have a concern that CPS share of the budget high has been growing and will continue to grow faster than other sectors. And on 19, they're holding until they hear our discussion. And we had, oh yeah, yeah, yeah yesterday, yesterday at uh, Carlisle Town meeting, um, the capital article and the, and the regional budget both passed. Um, so many thanks to, to Carrie and to uh, Tracy and Court and Cynthia for coming over to Carlisle with uh, Jared and Lori. Um, the region was well represented yes. last night. We may have been <laughs> maybe the majority in the audience. <laughs> it was, it was really Come on challenge. now. But it was interesting to see the solar canopy, I have to say. Yeah, that's oh, you hadn't been over. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no. And yeah. Lori and I stood under that. Yes, it was the last shade, shade last summer. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Lori, I think your presentation really uh, was instrumental in uh, the, uh, the what universal acceptance of uh, the recommendation. Yeah, well, you know, um, team effort on that. The information was, I think, the it was information exactly was the, very crisp, very thorough. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Pictures speak a thousand words. words. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Carlillians usually have lots of questions. And I yeah, was surprised. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We really only had a quiet. couple. Exactly yeah. my point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you're just going to encourage them. <laughs> All right. Uh, Is that it? I have, I have a couple. Oh, yeah. My, um, one, uh, I think we should note the obvious that uh, we have Alexa Anderson and Cynthia Rainey among us uh, having uh, emerged from the election um, oh, since we last that. met. So thank you, as well as other elected officials. Uh, we welcome them. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, yesterday, there was an event at the high school to support the community service opportunities for students, uh, mm -hmm. community service being a graduation requirement. And uh, the two volunteer organization was there. These are the local citizens who work with school administration to develop uh, different opportunities around the district for students. Um, there were a handful of tables in the cafeteria for about two and a half hours. So students could uh, stop by. And what they heard was the pitch that, uh, uh, the community service is not negotiable, but how you do community service is very much uh, the product of good decision making by students. And if they start early, and that was what, was what we advocated, you can start as early as exit of eighth grade, starting to earn your high school uh, requirements. Uh, you'll uh, reduce the, the burden of the junior and senior year if you get a lot of this under your belt. And we really pr tried to push that. And uh, uh, the the tribute tonight, I think, really should go to Terry Smoka and uh, Martha Hammer, who are the uh, school personnel who are really instrumental in making it actually work up there for students. I mean, many, many other people are there. Mr. Mastrulo was there as well. But in terms of the mechanics to make it work for students and the record keeping, which is all important, I think uh, Terry and, and Martha deserve uh, a great deal of credit. Um, it surprised me how many students uh, uh, walked up and said uh, to my question, yes, I've already met the requirement. And then I'd follow it with, well, are you going to go for the presidential level award? The answer usually was, I've already done that too. <laughs> <laughs> so it really was pretty impressive, very impressive. I mean, that's another, I, I mean, I commented before that I talked to so many friends with kids, high school and high schools, private schools, public schools all over the New England, tri-state area, Eastern seaboard. And I don't think there, I mean, the level of community service that our high school students were able to commit to and demonstrate and, and, and meet and, and engage in um, through the pandemic, I, I just think it was an exceptional uh, yes. showing and it just speaks so many volumes about, uh, about our communities, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Other? No. Okay, great. Well, uh, we'll get to building project later, Dr. Hunter and yep. Alexa, okay. I'm sure we'll yep. have stuff. Okay, so with that, we're at the superintendent's report. Great, thank you. I am realizing many items that are on my report are connected to other agenda items tonight. So I had two things I was going to highlight, similar to Tracy's comment, 
I thought it important to share out some of the work we're focused on in response and um, cooperation with the Metco families. And just to keep us all up to date, I'll preface all this by saying there's a lot of work to do. We're not in any way saying we're reaching all of the, the goals that we're all hoping for and we can need to continue to meet and talk and listen and collaborate and we're finding a date to do that. Um, transportation, we have added transportation on the weekends for high school students to be at athletic practices. We also ran buses last week during vacation for the first time. So we're excited by making sure those opportunities are accessible. We are in process right now. We survey the elementary families for needs before school because there are clubs at Alcott before school that are currently not available. The gift of Deb Jemison being acting director, she was able to remind us we were doing that where the kids would ride the middle school bus in and then go to Alcott to participate in COVID just undid all of it. So we are, we surveyed families. We've got four to eight kids who want to participate in chess and another club or two. And so we're working on the details of that this week so that those will be available. Uh, MECO Inc. is highly engaged with us. I think that's been a value add for everyone that they have been at the last couple of meetings and are committed to being really you know, front, front line with us and participatory. And that will uh, take another level on Thursday. Uh, Millie's coming out, the CEO is coming out with a couple others of her staff Thursday morning to the high school kids have all been invited to meet with them. Um, and have a 90 minute session just with the MECO directors and leadership, not with us present, and to talk about how they're seeing and feeling things. We know their voices are really important to us. Um, I'll be over afterwards to meet with Millie as well, Mr. Mastrullo and his team, and we'll debrief after they've had their sessions. We're hoping that's a, we hope the kids really engage in that and take us up on that opportunity. Uh, we're in the process of a letter that we're hoping to get out this week. Um, really just emphatically stating the prohibition on the N-word. It's, it's interesting, I was on with a number of superintendents this morning at one of my DEI courses, and we're all having this conversation. Some have put formal notices out, others haven't. We're all struggling with the, the need to stop the word and the challenges that go with that, but we are very committed to that, and we think it's important to set that statement. There's a lot of layers beyond the statement, but the statement is, I think, a really strong starting point. It will also be addressed through curriculum by, um, it will be in print. Some of these really diverse texts you've heard so much about have some of these words in print, but we're working, we have a, pl a protocol in place with staff so that they front load that with kids and work it through. And that's all, you know, things that we're just rolling out now and uh, really feel strongly we're going to, we're going to have in place. So, I think the other side of that is communicating all of that. And we're realizing some things we've been working on, we haven't communicated uh, very effectively, I guess. I'm looking at Kristen because she's part of that work. Uh, so I think, you know, those are some of the pieces we're working on. There's others that are smaller. There's others that are very bigger picture, um, but we're, I think, feeling like we're collaborative and communicative. I've been getting weekly emails to the Metco families on Friday, just with updates on where things are at, reminders of upcoming meetings. Once you set a policy discussion, that'll be in there. I'm getting nice emails back from them often after they meet on Saturday. So I hear where they're at. And I think that flow is just really, really critical as well. So we're, we're working and uh, committed to continuing to move forward. Uh, my only other real update offline of uh, the topics that will come up later tonight is the Thoreau fire that we are beginning to put behind us. As of today, all of the kids are back in the 19, no, the 2022 wing <laughs> that is fresh and bright and beautiful. Everybody's moved in. I cannot say enough to the Thoreau staff, yes. the new CTA leadership is here, and just the collaboration they've had with us. The creativity to make this move, the third move for most of these teachers in since school open, um, make that doable and the cooperation of the community on the half day that you approved, the teamwork from all the teachers that didn't move and the help that they gave. It really has just been an enormous, impressive, collaborative effort. Um, and we're, we're so relieved to see some of this behind us. The mods will start to they are being dismantled as we speak. Actual retrieval of them is probably next week or so. Um, we're in some discussion right now that I just wanna put on your radar. We've had a never ending 
similar parking conversation at Thoreau as we have had in other places. There could be an op before we reseed the field. We're going to see what the options are um, since the field's torn apart and full of gravel at the moment anyway. So more to come on that, but before we just put it back, Where's see what the needs are. I've always wondered that. They fill the lot and then they the overflow street. into the streets. Yeah, I think yeah. That I just didn't know if yeah. something secret I didn't so, know. No, there's no neighbors. secret. <laughs> yeah, they're out in the neighborhood. So yeah. it's worth a look at what the options are yeah. since everything's under sure. construction anyway. But um, it feels really good to be on this side of this event. And I'm just, you know, really impressed with the way the resilience of that Thoreau staff has been handled. And thanks again to the CTA, Mary Beth's here. She's been a real ad, real ally with us over there and working with her, and her Angel's teachers. On the call. Oh, and Angel, you're on the call. Shout out of great proportion to Angel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the leadership there, both union and administrative has been extraordinary. And, um, and we're Julie just- also. Yeah. Oh, thank you for reading the list. <laughs> All of you who are part of it, we're really, really grateful for their tireless work and yes. um, how much it took to get this to happen. So it's a lot. It's been a lot. If you had told us a year ago yeah. on top of COVID and everything else, we were going to put a fire that, you know, displaced a build, you know, a third of a building for nine, you know, eight months of the school year, we would have thought there's no way we could do that. And right. Well, we did it too. Have, so. right. yeah. Good. Well done. All right. Yes, thank so you. good, thank good, you good news. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Can I put a couple of questions your way? Sure. Um, the replacement for open circle. Um, do you think before the end of the year, you'll be able to confirm where the district will go with that? Yeah, Kristen, that'll be part of an update. You can, I, I can say, you right can now. say now. Uh, I, I sure. don't want to push it if, if it's still. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. there okay. Are committee if, members here. We've had a 25 member. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've had a. a Thank you. Important yet. Uh, okay. So we've had a 25 member uh, social emotional learning for elementary schools uh, committee because our current curriculum open circles going out of business so we have it for another year uh, online, uh, so we uh, charge this committee um, with choosing a new one so we uh, really deeply interviewed seven companies. Um, really different than when we were looking at Open Circle 30 years ago, um, because a lot of curricula are now online. There's a lot of videotape, you know, acting things out and so forth. Um, but at our recent meeting, the committee uh, voted to pilot test next year uh, a curriculum from Responsive Classroom uh, Company, which is called Fly Five. Um, it's a lot like Open Circle in the how it addresses um, and it's been around for a long time so we have a lot of um, colleagues in other districts that have used uh, responsive classroom in particular that approach and then the curriculum so next year any elementary teachers who want to will be given the opportunity to pilot the curriculum at the end of next school year they'll vote about whether or not we should adopt it um, and then if they vote to adopt, then we'll do a whole big training and, and so forth. If they vote not to, then we'll try pilot testing something else. Yeah. And we always look at how one initiative supports other initiatives. Um, so rhetorical question now, um, uh, I'm assuming that responsive classroom and our DEI objectives, in your opinion, are nicely aligned. So that's, yeah, that's so a good the thing. The criteria that we used uh, for evaluating the curricula, we used the CASEL five, which are the five right. competencies. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had several others. One was um, how individuals were represented. So what did visual look like in terms of identity, um, mirrors and windows, like we always talk about. Um, and so that fly five in particular came highly recommended from our, our committee, uh, in that area. But another one is homeschool connection. You know, what, what kind of training is there for parents, um, and support letters going home and, and so forth. Yeah. We don't get enough opportunities to thank the people who serve on these committees. So if you'd extend our appreciation, yes, please yeah. do so. Yeah. Good. Um, thank you. On an unrelated matter, um, uh, but very important matter, actually, how unrelated, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, hateful language uh, and uh, how we manage appropriate speech in the schools. 
um, the work you're doing right now. Will MASS uh, bring this before uh, legal review so we don't have any un unanticipated consequences? I don't know that we need to do that. We're certainly okay. being guided by our either. current yeah. policies yeah. and okay. handbooks, mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. I would strongly say we're leaning on handbooks, um, which are so highly oriented towards the, the law mm -hmm. and the school committee policies. Um, I think okay. if we got really out of the box on something that feels like it needs a look, we certainly could run it by probably more likely a portion of our district council that works on the student side of things and has worked with us on other handbook language and things like that. I think we have that option if we need it. Great, but, all right, thank you. Yeah, Very helpful, question. thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Dr. Hunter, on to the COVID update. Yes, maybe this is a do good we, sign that I do didn't we still have something. Well, I do. I think the good news is I didn't feel the need to put it as a separate document to show you. I think it's brief enough. I can just verbally speak to it. So that's progress. Um, we are watching cases this week as we come back from vacation. We're at 34 as of today. So that's definitely a little bit higher than we've seen. Uh, last week over the break, there were 44 and all. And of course, the reporting gets a little less timely with the vacation and all. So we're definitely seeing a little bit of the national uptick plus the vacation impact. Um, just a note, the week before the break, we had a small event at one of the kindergarten classrooms in Willard. And the reason I really bring that up is because in talking with the local health officials and DESE, the answer is very clear. Remote learning is no longer an option. If you, and of course, with it's only one classroom, like Peabody, that was a whole grade. So, and it, it's that odd part of being a whole building as well. So it felt like we closed a school. We actually had a grade be home for a day and they need to make that up. It wasn't remote. And so in having that conversation, that was very clear that we're not gonna flip a classroom with seven cases to a remote learning environment, even when the kids stop, you know, we had some trickle of kids not coming because they didn't want COVID over the vacation. And, you know, we only have five kids in a classroom and you sort of have to ask like, these questions. So I think it was very informative. They are in an endemic mode of, we're gonna make our way through the events as they happen, offer instruction to who's there, work with kids who aren't, um, keep an eye on numbers. They all, always offer me more antigen tests to you know, really front load those to the classroom or wherever we think the exposures are, keep an eye on the you know, spread and really work with us on that. So it's still a lot of support there, but definitely with a mindset of keeping kids in school. So I think it's worth just noting that. And certainly I did communicate that with the community. Hopefully we won't see that kind of event um, again, but it seems like we're figuring out how to manage it if we do. And then the final piece is the state is, has been very quiet on the funding for the testing program, other than to say it's extended past April. Um, so that I'm, in, I'm inferring there's probably funding till the end of the school year and we're gonna plan to participate until the money is not available. Mm -hmm. um, I'm expecting they're tapping their federal funds from, from that mm -hmm. source. So um, we're pretty status quo. We've had a regular number, regardless of all of what's going on of about 1400 people test every week, adults and stat, uh, students combined. So still some real strong value there, especially at the K-8 schools so um status quo i which is i think the good news yeah Great. also carlisle the testing has stayed uh yeah consistent. That's great. yeah so the, it's good it's really good yep great <clears throat> all right okay so on to the sustainability uh, nope. the special education update debbie is debbie here debbie dixon so if we could yeah, have Debbie come, come up. In. I've been scanning the, the Zoom. No, <laughs> no she's here in person. person. This is so exciting to see you. So Erin has her slides, so she can load that. Debbie can come sit near Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back, Debbie. Yeah, good to see Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course, it's nice to be here. Debbie, before Mark says it, just pull that microphone really close so we can really <laughs> capture you. <laughs> you want to be in mic jail. And I just want to note before you start that we're going to be seeing a little bit of you um, over the next. Yeah, there's coming presentations, MTSS oriented, which will have a lot of staff involved too. That's upcoming in May. And there's a 
literacy, you'll have the condensed version on the 10th. There, there's a parent forum scheduled on literacy updates, MTSS, RTI, which is a lot of acronyms that I shouldn't be just throwing out like that. But <laughs> Kristen is going to work us. on, uh, <laughs> you all know them. So uh, that's the 16th of May, and we'll be getting notice out to families shortly on that. So Debbie's got a broader view of the work in special ed as her year has gone on and just giving you a state of the union report essentially correct thank you thanks for the introduction so i have a lot of information i'm going to speak quickly so tell me to slow down if i need to um so once again thank you very much um you can move the slide so long erin um I, and yeah you can move to the next one so I always want to begin with just an overview of inclusion, um, because that's what guides my principles and the work that I do here. I presented this slide and this information when I was here in November. Um, it was written by Tom Hare, who was the former, um, he, a former professor of education at Harvard and also the director of special education at the office um, special ed in Washington. And he um, came upon, he developed this definition of inclusion, which spoke to me. And it's been my guiding principles for a very long time. And I always wanna share this whenever I speak about special education, because I, I think it really, I wanna promote this thinking and just always share that um, inclusion is a belief system. It's not a location. And I just will repeat that again and again and again until um, we all live and breathe that type of thinking. Um, next, please. Um, and I also, this is also a repeat slide um, because I wanna promote this thinking as well. Um, our responsibility in special education is to teach our students the skills and strategies um, the skills that are impacted by the disability and the strategies that the students need to compensate for the disability impact. And we do this to promote, um, to, to allow the students to become self-sufficient, self-reliant, independent learners who can advocate for themselves. And we do this through research-based practices, through a high quality instruction, state-of-the-art uh, techniques, um, universal design, accessible materials, and um, through meaningful and thoughtful accommodations and modifications in our classrooms. And, and everyone takes ownership. So special education, there's not a divide between general ed and special education. We all own all students. Next, please. Um, at the last session in November, um, I reviewed the West Ed reports um, and the program evaluations that were conducted several years ago across all of our um, programs, and we highlighted some of the recommendations. Here are a few that we're working on. Um, we mentioned MTSS, the Multi-Tiered System of Support, and Kristen is leading the charge here, and we're going to be back to share some a lot more information about that. So I'm not going to speak about that tonight. Um, one of the recommendations was improving the transition process from level to level and building to building. Um, and we're doing a lot of work on that this year. So Michelle Saravera, our elementary special education coordinator, and Janet O'Shea, the preschool coordinator, um, have set a goal, collaborative goal this year to improve the process of um, transitioning our preschoolers to kindergarten this year. So there's been a lot of coordination, collaboration, communication, observation um, for our preschoolers who are moving on to kindergarten. Um, and we started the process very early in the year. Um, we've had a lot of meetings and we're hoping to document the process, make it real clear. Um, for subsequent years and make sure that the process is seamless for parents and for the children and for the receiving schools. Um, we've done the same thing for the fifth to sixth grade transition. We sent letters out earlier in the year, I think in December to rising sixth grade families um, of students on IEPs. We held an, an orientation evening for parents of children on IEP 
on IEPs. Um, we've done a lot of communication once again for fifth to sixth grade teachers and therapists to share information about children to make sure that programming was established. And um, we've had meetings with parents as well, ongoing meetings and transition meetings. And the same process was um, occurred for the ninth, excuse me, the eighth to ninth grade transition. And we also included Carlisle eighth grade families in that process as well. And we actually held two orientation sessions for the high school um, families. And we'll perfect it even more so next year. We had a couple of blips, but we'll perfect it um, even more so. Um, we have ongoing work with our district-wide practices and procedures. We're really working hard to streamline our work, make sure that there's continuity and consistency with our paperwork, with our practices, with our approaches, with what we do. And that could range from anything from a, a form letter that we send out in response to um, an activity or a, an event um to just how we um how we monitor our ieps in terms of how many days it takes to send it to the central office to is how long it takes to get out to parents and what the expectations are for the paperwork to be attached to that just all sorts of things and just making it clear um for everybody and that's going well actually it's, there's a lot to do there um and the teachers and therapists and the staff want to see um, this all documented and they want to follow. They're very rule-based, teachers are rule-based. Did you know that? They, they want to see everything in writing. So we're working to um, develop all of these procedures for folks. Um, parent outreach and communication is the next on this list. Parent engagement is critical to the success in education and particularly in special education. And we have, um, enjoyed, I think, greater parent outreach and communication with our uh, coordinators at each level. And um, we've also enjoyed a really, I think, a very positive and proactive working relationship with CPAC this year. Um, we've supported their events and um, have publicized for them and I think um, have really promoted CPAC, we're really working to expand membership and involvement of parents, and we'll figure that out um, over the course of the year um, and into next year. And we're very pleased at the working relationship that we've developed. Um, and then lastly on this list is expanding and enhance, enhancing the continuum of services and programs. And with the support of the school committee, we've been able to um, move forward with expanding our um programs um for some of our higher need um students and the one that i'd like to talk about tonight is the um language-based program erin you can move to the next slide i shared with you um separately in document of the language-based program draft program description um this is a program that we've had at the elementary level. We've had language-based programming at the middle school level, but we didn't have a program at the high school. With what we've done at this point um, is contracted with Landmark Outreach, who will be working with us at the, for the elementary, middle school, and high school to develop a complete um, language-based program. And we've worked with Landmark right now to do initial program development and design. We've drafted the program description that you have. Um, we called the program the lab program right now. It stands for language and beyond. Um, we were advised that we shouldn't be using the name of the disability in the program title, which makes sense. Um, and we've um, established the student profile so we can identify appropriate students for um, the programs. We already know who those students are. Um, so that what this does is creates a vertical alignment from our elementary through our high school um, schools. Um, part of the program and part of the beauty of this uh, design is that we will have partner classrooms. These are the gen ed classrooms 
where the students will um, participate typically in science and social studies um, for the content areas. The teachers will be part of the language-based program model and will receive training on a monthly basis with Landmark um, and where Landmark will come in and observe and meet with teachers, provide training um, and will uh, promote best practices for students with language-based learning disabilities and other specific learning disabilities. Um, the focus of the program, of course, will be reading, written language, executive functioning, and the the what will what we will be able to do within this program is is modify the pace and the volume and the complexity of the language that the children are exposed to, so that they will reach mastery of the skills um, and be successful. The other thing that I didn't put on this slide that I need to mention is that. These students are students who often are very frustrated at their lack of um, progress. These are bright, capable learners, um, yet they are not able to read. They're not able to write at a pace commensurate with their peers. And they see this and they feel this. So part of the program is to help students um, with their metacognitive skills, with their self-awareness, with their understanding of the brain research, um, even at very young levels. So they understand that they're, they're, they have a perfectly good brain, works a little bit differently. And we are here to help them <coughs> circumvent that, um, those neurons in their brains to um, help get that reading and writing in place and intact and move ahead. So there'll be a psychologist involved with the program as well and um, help with the social emotional piece of it that often impacts some of these kiddos. Next slide, please. So now I'm jumping into a lot of numbers. Um, as you know, every October, March, and June, um, DESE collects numbers and um, out of our student information management system and provides us with a lot of data. So here you just have an update for a March 1st um, headcount numbers um, with respect to special education. What I've tried to do is give you um, current numbers in that first column for, for March 2022. Um, you can see in preschool we had 30. If you go across the line in October, we had 17. So we've seen um, a lot of new kiddos coming into our preschool. And in June of 21, we had 23 students. Um, at Al Alcott, we had 50 students out of 423. That represents 11.8%. And in October, we had 45. And last June, we had 66. So I'm not going to read the whole slide to you, but just so you can see that. Um, the itinerant students, um, many folks ask, what does that mean? Itinerant students are students who are in private school at private expense. Um, they could be homeschooled students. They could be preschool students who come to us for uh, services only, like speech therapy or OT or perhaps reading services. Um, hmm. And we have just a handful of those students typically. Next slide. What I wanted to do um, was to break out the elementary school programs a little bit for you. Alcott houses the um, branch program, which is our SEL program, and it's for students in grades three to five. So if we removed the students from the overall headcount here, um, it decreases the percentage of the overall school population from 11.8% to 10.2%. At Thoreau, there's more of a significant impact. Um, Thoreau houses two programs. Um, one is the intensive learning program, and the other is an autism program. Both of those programs are K to five programs. So there's a, some significant numbers in those programs. And that decrease, if, if we remove those students from the headcount, <laughs> It decreases the percentage of students there to 14.5%. Um, 
and at Willard, um, where that language based program is, it is in grades three to five, and it reduces um, the percentage to 10%. In all cases, our numbers are, are, if we put everything together, our percentage of students is less than the state average, which is around 17%. And I think that's been fairly consistent over the years. Uh, next slide. I don't think I shared this with you last time. Um, this is our placement data um, taken from our March 1st count. Um, this, the full inclusion, students are categorized into full inclusion, partial inclusion, or sub-separate. And this represents our in-district programming for grades, uh, excuse me, for ages six through 21. And um, we have 95% of our students are in full or partial inclusion programs at, at both CPS and CCHS. Next slide. This represents the March 1st headcount of the um, disability categories. And this is a primary uh, disability category is, is um, identified on students' IEPs. Um, as we know, there are many students who have secondary and even tertiary disabilities identified. DESI only reports their primary disability. Um, this is pretty consistent with previous reports, but there are some variations. And the ones that are most noticeable are note, uh, note um, is that there's an increase in the emotional Disability category, it's up by 12 since October. Um, health is up by nine. SLD or specific learning is up by 10. And autism is up by eight. And neurological is down by 12. All the others remained relatively the same. Next slide, please. In November, somebody asked how our evaluations compared this year to last year, and I hadn't a clue. Um, but I um, pulled this in, we pulled this information from our um, Aspen, our software program. And in red, you can see the um, initial evaluation requests for the current school year. Um, those that are found eligible and those obviously then not found not eligible. And then in the black um, are those for the last school year. Um, I think that we're on track to meet <laughs> the same number as last year and it, or probably exceed the number of 99 evaluations from last year. What I'd like to share is that at the preschool level, the evaluation requests typically come from early intervention, where students, uh, you know, our little ones are um, supported through early intervention, which is a DPH funded um, program for children ages zero to three, or from parents um, who are concerned about speech and language or overall development. At the elementary level, roughly two thirds of the evaluation requests come from our own child study teams or teacher assistant teams. Um, and one third probably come from parents. At the middle school and high school, most of the requests come from parents. Um, next slide, please. I thought this was interesting to share with you. Um, our numbers of uh, translation and interpreter requests um, have increased over the years. This is data that we just keep in our office um, because it's processed. This represents only the requests for special education translations and interpretation. Um, Kristen takes care of the rest for the rest of the district. So there's many more. Um, but in special education, we have multiple meetings, we have mul which require interpretation, and we have thousands of papers, and <laughs> documents that require um, translation, uh, evaluation reports that could be 20 pages long, IEPs that are 
15 to 20 pages long um, meeting invitations that need to be translated. So um, the requests have, have almost doubled, or have doubled. Um, and this is as of April 19th. The data shows as of April 19th. Um, this actually represents 32 students <laughs> right now. Um, sorry, it represents by 32 students and nine languages that we're um, having to deal with this year. And again, it's just reflective of special education. Some of these youngsters are also receiving ELL services too, but they may also have been identified with disabilities. Next slide, please. If a student is found not to have um, a disability and be eligible for special education, it's possible that the child may be referred to um, the 504 team for consideration for 504 eligibility. Um, and I just wanted to share some of this information with you as um, the director of student services is also responsible, uh, responsible for 504 accommodation plans. Um, so just for um, purposes of discussion, 504 accommodation plans are for uh, non-discrimination um, based on disability, um, is to provide equal access to education. It's also beyond education, it's for extracurricular activities and athletics. And our, the same standard applies to 504s as it does to for special education. And that's um, the standard of FAPE, which is a legal standard, meaning free appropriate public education. Next slide. Um, the difference between um, Section 504 and special education is that 504 is a civil rights law to stop discrimination and special education is a federal law under IDEA um, that provides for specialized instruction for children with disabilities. Eligibility for a 504 plan um, is that a child must have a disability that substantially limits a major life function. And the next slide, please. This is just a listing of those major life functions. It's pretty broad and the, the bar is pretty low for eligibility. Next slide, please. The process is somewhat similar in determining eligibility for 504. Um, we must, if we suspect a disability, we must um, evaluate that child for 504. Um, we must determine eligibility, we must develop a plan, we must implement the plan, we must monitor the child's progress. We have to review and reevaluate appropriately, and there is a grievance process um, that's very similar to special education. What the 504 laws are silent on are timelines. Um, special ed is very specific. We have five days for this, 10 days for that, 30 days for this. Um, 504 process has no timelines, yet the the guidance is that we follow similar time timelines that special ed does. Mm -hmm. So that's what we try to adhere to. Um, and it makes sense and it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. This is our current data and our numbers of 504 plans. We have, um, I think you can see that a dramatic increase at the high school level, something that we're exploring um, and looking into. And um, we are also exploring our DCAP and how that impacts um, 504 implementation or requests. And we're just beginning to look at this. Deb, could you just define DCAP? Okay. I'm sorry, it's the district curriculum accommodation plan, which is um, should be available to all children. It was based in law many years ago that so folks would not require kids to have a 504 plan or an IEP to provide routine accommodations. So it just allows teachers to provide um, accommodations for any child that's sitting in front of them to meet the diverse 
needs of students um, in their classes. So, um, you know, preferential seating and extra time and um, for students with attentional challenges, you know, just um, gaining attention, just very basic and routine accommodations should be available to all children. So universal um, accommodations and every building um, and district is required to have them. So we're up in the process of updating ours and it's a challenge to um, for many districts to have uh, DCAPs and 504 plans and sometimes 504 plans are including DCAP accommodations and they shouldn't 504 should be uh, you know well above and beyond uh, routine accommodations. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we're digging into a little bit. Next slide, please. So I have just a few DESI updates. Um, on an annual basis, <clears throat> DESI um, rates districts um, in terms of equity and special education, uh, they, uh, through data analysis, uh, they measure whether students with um, disabilities overall and from certain racial and ethnic groups are suspended or expelled more so than other students or disproportionately. And they also look at whether students from certain racial and ethnic groups are disproportionately receiving special education um, services in general and in specific um, disability categories. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, some students with um, ELL services are also on IEPs. We have to be very careful um, and do our due diligence with that because in many areas, um, students with uh, second language learners are considered or could be considered to have language disabilities. And it's not a language disability, it's a language barrier. So they should not be identified as a student with a disability. Um, there are many um, students, there are many black students who have been identified with a communication disability. Um, and it's not a disability, it's black dialect. And we need to be aware of that. It's not a disability. Um, and we should not assume that um, everybody speaks like we do or like I do, and it doesn't create a disability. So there are, you know, having been in a district where we were at risk for disproportionality, um, because of that, we were required to go through some training um, and heighten awareness around that. So I have to say, fortunately, we were not found to be disproportionate in CPS or CCHS, um, but I think the awareness about disproportionality um, is a factor that we must um, just keep our eyes on. Uh, next slide, please. The other um, area that DESI looks at is our special ed determination. Um, they're required to look at each district and determine whether we have any need for technical assistance regarding special education um, services or interventions. And it's based on a number of data points. They're listed here. Um, part of the uh, special education state performance plan also includes preschool outcomes, uh, parent involvement, post-secondary outcomes. I think that might be listed there. Um, through a cycle of reporting that we have to do, and we were able to, um, we were not found to have any need. They rate us in four different areas. It's either um, meets requirements, has some level of need, has a significant need. I can't remember the other one, but we were, um, CCHS earned a 34 out of 36 possible points for a score of 94% and CPS earned 21 out of 24 with a score of 87% meeting requirements. Um, if we didn't meet requirements, actually in both disproportionality or in um, this need, we would have to develop a, a corrective action plan. We would have to use some of our federal funding to provide training. We would have to get endorsement from, from the state on our 
improvement plan. Um, we would have to go to several trainings through the state. Um, and it's, um, it takes away from some of the other work that we're supposed to be doing. So we, we're actually doing the work and we're doing it well right now. And we hope to continue to do that. Um, next slide, please. So this is the last section here. Um, so this is, I just wanted to update you on our work with DocuSign. I think this is a nice segue into the next presentation. Um, um, uh, you can um, hit the next. So we started using DocuSign in February. Um, we use it for the IEPs at the preschool level and at the elementary level. Next. We also use it for evaluation and reevaluation consent forms. There's a constant flow of IEPs and consent forms back and forth from our office. Um, if you're familiar with special education at all, we we are so heavily laden with paperwork. It's incredible. And for years, I've said we've got to go greener. We've got to be greener. We, there's something we can do about this. And we said, how about DocuSign? And um, because of the pandemic, it was something that um, we had explored in, in another district. And it's like, well, can we do this here? And we got the go ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, we are ecstatic about it. Um, we recently added out of district IEPs and we will soon be adding the middle school and high school. Um, we needed a slow rollout because there were a few glitches. We needed to understand the system. Um, so you can click next and next, Erin. So it's efficient and it is sustainable. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is, this is information from um, DocuSign itself. This is the impact that I think we're contributing to. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't just what we're doing, but you know, <laughs> we're saving trees, we're saving water, we're saving carbon, and we're saving waste. Um, if you think about the production of paper um, in the, um, they had some analytics that they they talked about, but for the envelopes that we would be saving, um, the, the, the copying and the ink and everything, it's, it's just incredible. Um, next, this is our data. So to date, this is through from mid-February through April 19th, we've sent 190 documents. Each document is called an envelope. Um, and as of this writing, uh, we had 147 completed, 16 were delivered, or 21 were sent, 16 were delivered. That meant the parents opened them up and there were a few that were still pending. Um, the next slide, this is the beauty of this. This is the efficiency piece of it. Um, you can see that many of the documents were returned in one to two days. Mm -hmm. So when I think back, it's like post-its. What did we do without <laughs> them? Hmm. In one to two days, we are getting these documents sent, signed and received back. So we're able to either implement IEPs or begin evaluations. Things aren't lost in the mail. Things aren't sitting, parents tell us, you know, they sit on my desk for weeks and months and I forget about them. Mm -hmm. And um, parents, the feedback seems to be extremely positive. Um, and I think that we are saving, we're doing our part to save the planet and to be a little bit um, greener. And that's it. I think that's it. Erin, is that the last slide? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, ha I had a list of questions I was making as I was going along, but you answered them as uh, as we went along. And so oh, good. <laughs> always uh, never sure if my questions are legitimate, and <laughs> they're great. Um, we look forward to hearing more about MTSS yeah. and uh, and, and uh, all the other work at the upcoming meetings. And so I, I don't have any questions for you. Just many many thanks. Uh, and, but uh, hoping to. I have, I have a question. Numbers. I have a question. All right. I have a question. DocuSign and paperless. Will parents have the option to go paperless even on the IEPs at any point or no? Could you 
So this is, you know, that's a great question. We initially had um, said that we were going to give parents the option at meetings saying, do you want the emails? Do you want a hard copy? Do you want DocuSign? Now we are saying we will send you your IEPs through DocuSign. Okay. But that's if that's not an option and it isn't for some families, yeah. we will give them an option. We can do it in whatever way they manner they choose. Um, but most parent families are saying send a DocuSign. Send a DocuSign. Yeah. And are you moving towards the middle school and the high school next year? Is that the hope? No, not yet. Next week. Next week. No. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, please. I'd, I'd like to do the training um, within the next couple of weeks oh great um it's actually fairly easy mm -hmm. to do i thought it was a little bit more complicated but when i actually looked at it i can even do it so right. that's great i think we can get it done quickly yeah okay anyone else uh, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. so um as a parent uh i think i need to rent to u-haul when i got my son's paperwork after he graduated um would there is it required by law that you provide all the documents to families upon graduation or are you just trying to get rid of all that paper <laughs> so it's required by law that within we have to keep documents for seven at least up to seven years mm -hmm. um we can give the families the documents is at graduation if we so desire right so that's what we do here right um that's actually one of the processes that we're trying to clean up and make make sure that we're doing it consistently so we have um in our software program we upload everything so mm -hmm. we have everything digitally right so we can share we can download and either email that to folks or we could print that for folks so you'd have all of the records but well, you could digitally use electronically yeah okay that would be so might it, need a hard drive but yeah <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> so those are some of the things that we're still trying Working to work on. through. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But that's still, that sounds a lot better. It's, it, yes. Yeah. Great. But otherwise, I thought the presentation was incredibly clear and helpful and loaded with lots of great data. Um, and I look forward to MTSS and DCAP. I, I like to hear those things. So, because uh, DCAP is, is like general ed, right? It's clearly targeted to general ed students. MTSS? No. Well, D MTSS oh, can span the whole, oh, yeah. all, everybody, right? Yeah. But DCAP is part of general ed. Okay, yep. great. Yeah, and it reinforces that idea that, that everybody has learning differences and that uh, you've got to meet the kid where where they're available to meet you. Right. You know, and that's just great to be reinforced in the general ed classroom. Okay, I have questions. <laughs> My favorite person. Um, I have questions about um, evaluations. It looks like you had an um, uh, uptick in evaluations this year for the high school students. Um, is it um, due to pandemic? And also, um, if the students didn't qualify for IEPs, did you find uh, many of them uh, qualify for 504 plans? Um, and then uh, specific learning disability. Are we talking about dyslexia? And how many kids did we did we pick up pick up any kids at uh, at the high school level, or um, what were the the type of uh, disabilities that we were picking up? So if you had given me those questions before tonight, I would have been able to come in with the data. <laughs> I don't have the specifics. But I think the um, in response to your first question, though, I do think the uptick is due to the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, the 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 missed learning, perhaps from from last year. Um, I don't, I don't, I wasn't here, so I don't know. But um, we're seeing, we are seeing more concerns from parents. I do see a lot of um, students with social emotional um, concerns and behavioral concerns right now. Um, we're seeing that at the middle school particularly um, and some at the high school. Um, in terms of dyslexia, we um, have implemented a protocol for testing um, very specifically to evaluate for dyslexia um, across the board from elementary through high school. 
and we've had training um, across the board for that. So we are identifying more um, students and are able to say with confidence, the student has dyslexia. Um, I don't have specifics though. I don't have baseline data to say how many more we have now. Um, but I do believe that we've identified students at the high school level. And I know that we've identified students at the elementary level. Um, and the third question was, um, <laughs> oh, yes, do many see, students, right. yes, many students that not all students are recommended for 504. Um, there has to be a disability right. present. So if there's a disability and the child doesn't require specialized instruction through an IEP, um, there may be a consideration for a referral to the 504 team. And we collaborate with the 504 team to um, alert them and they do their own evaluation because there are different standards for that, for eligibility for the 504. So yes. And that's our job to make sure that's under child find. Okay, no, that's excellent. And now uh, I had another question uh, in terms of DCAP. If, um, as a parent, if you have a concern that you know the child is not is having a hard time in, in uh, some of the classes, um, is the uh, would what would be the, the directional process? Would there be a guidance counselor that would be recommending and communicating about you know, the resources and um, uh, with the teachers in the classroom uh, uh, that are available to that particular student? Yes. Uh, or would there be a teacher identifying a student? Like what's the process just so parents can uh, at home understand it? At the high school level, I at know the it's, the guidance, yeah. Yeah, it's the guidance counselor and they actually write um, ISSPs, yep. an ISSP individual student support plan, success plan, um, is the DCAP accommodation plan. And it, it's written by the guidance counselor and shared with the teachers. And we don't have a process at the elementary level per se, but that's what we're working on and we'll want to be rolling out in September. And we want to make the DCAP very visible and available to all teachers and parents. I just wanted to commend you on um, bringing up the DCAP and um, also um, publicizing that uh, program uh, during uh, the uh, meet and greet with uh, the uh, coordinators. Um, that was, you know, information that I, as a parent, did not, I was not aware, but. Um, uh, not only we met the coordinate coordinators for the high school, but also they um, gave us a little bit, uh, and the parents on the call, they gave us uh, a good amount of um, education about the, the program itself. Okay. So that out, outreach is happening and um, that, okay. that will be helpful to, to families. Coordination through Carlisle is, is crucial. Yes, yeah, and I so did bring that to Carlisle. Great. Yeah. I had a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I um, wasn't here for your November presentation and I thought this was incredibly informative and you delivered it in such a fluent and um, articulate manner. So thank you for, for breaking it down the way you did. Um, I learned a lot, so thank you so much. I had um, I had a couple of questions that were similar. I, I was surprised that COVID wasn't mentioned in it in a, in a positive way, because <laughs> um, I think you know, everyone is concerned about the impact of COVID in particular on, on how, how, on our kids and their learning. Um, so I, I was interested in Eva's question on that. My one question, I'm, I thought this language and beyond program is really interesting. Um, I'm just curious and about the timeline. How, do, how long does it take to develop something like that? Um, pilot it, implement it. I, I love the idea of the continuity between K through 12 and how it's really thoughtful about between grades and then between schools. I thought that was really interesting. So I can, I'm happy to show, give you a private viewing of the November presentation. Okay. So we, have, <laughs> we have the background, um, but what, the, so the program, the language based program um, has been in existence at the elementary level. Yep. We didn't have it at the middle school or the high school level. And 
we need to develop a continuum of service. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a through line, a vertical alignment, um, because we have students at those levels who have the need. And um, we want to make sure that those students stay in district yep. and, and we can meet their needs here. And um, so uh, I'm circumventing that, the question, but the, to create the program um, is, we're we're planning to have this up and running in September. Oh wow! So we've done a lot of work this year. So mm -hmm. we've been doing um, having multiple meetings with Landmark, doing the program design. It's um, the, the folks at the high school and at the middle school have um, already established the schedule. They've identified the um, partner classroom teachers. Um, the scheduling at the high school and middle school was probably the biggest challenge, um, but uh, they, uh, Brian at the high school and um, Olive are just incredible. They just can visualize schedule and understand what they need to do and they did it in a heartbeat. Um, our consultant has met with large groups, small groups. He's presented to the entire elementary special education staff. Um, regarding the program, and um, we're ready to go. So it, it, we're That's in the process exciting. of hiring, we're That's in the great. process of um, getting it together. We need to get the materials. Like we know what we're doing, we know what we need to do. <laughs> so we're ready to go. We're very excited about it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. That's yeah. incredible. I had a little more questions about because this is so exciting. We uh, We are expanding a program, uh, uh, language-based program into the high school. Um, and um, uh, Len Marcus very, has an excellent reputation. I see that you will be also uh, looking at as executive functioning of those students as well. Yes. Um, uh, I, I have a question in terms of uh, training of the teachers because it's, it's going to be a brand new program. What does the process look like um, at the high school when it comes to teaching kids how to read and those comprehension skills and um, language based means that every class the child is learning those skills through um, those language skills through the curriculum. Um, so do you have a big buy in excited teachers to, um, to that's my understanding. That road? <laughs> yes. Yes. In every subject, or what does that look like? It's primarily, again, the sciences and the um, social studies. I think that, oh gosh, I believe that the freshmen will not be taking world cultures, um, but they'll take the science at that level, and then they'll take the history at the sophomore level. I, I, I don't want to misspeak, um, but the, these are the details that we worked out. And I don't want to say I had a large part in it. I was there, but they, um, you know, Brian and and Katie and Fran and um, Nancy Booten and and several other folks were really instrumental in really looking at the needs of the students and understanding the high school courses and figuring out what they needed. They also looked at the math levels, and many of our students are quite capable of of high level math. Um, but challenged with the reading and the writing. Mm -hmm. um, the program itself will have separate ELA um, coursework and the comprehension strategies will be taught within that as well as the writing. Executive functioning will be a separate um, piece of that along with the study skills and the metacognition strategies. The partner teachers um, in the classrooms will be part of the monthly consult with Landmark and those strategies will be taught. Um, Landmark is also coming in to do a, a PD pathway next year, so to spread the wealth and the news and the work, you know, the good work um, to, to many teachers. Um, it's really good teaching practice, but we want that continuity and consistency um, from the program to the gen ed classroom. So there's going to be um, consistency from within the program to the gen ed classrooms and program staff will be partnering and co-teaching in those classes as well. That's excellent. It's really exciting. It's very exciting. And I, and I hope that, you know, a lot of, of that great information um, that, that comes 
uh, that research-based information that comes for, from, uh, that is built uh, to support children with special educational needs. It is so relevant to um, other kids in general education uh, classes and, and having a team come in and um, spread that information yeah. horizontally and, and get everyone uh, richer in more skills to help kids is very exciting to see. Absolutely. I think we're good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. That was yeah. awesome. We'll see a lot more. Of you. I feel like <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Okay. Are we? Oh, and we've got the sustainability in the curriculum. So we have. Yep. Good. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Erin's going to be sharing the slides, yeah. and I am joined in this <clears throat> presentation by my colleagues, Allison Forsetter, who is our Hi. elementary curriculum coordinator, Carrie Berserke. I'm looking for your face up there, uh, our middle school science coordinator, I saw her and name. Mike Vella. I see you, um, who is our high school department chair in science. So I would take this team to the end of the earth. They are so fantastic. And we present on a lot of things um, uh, in the area of science. But since it's four days after Earth Day and a few days before the Cooler Concord um, Festival, uh, we thought this would be a great way for you to learn about how sustainability is taught in our curriculum. Next slide, Aaron. So uh, if you could go back one. So we teach sustainability in three ways. The first is that it is informally taught through the structures in our built environment. And we're so excited for those in our new middle school. But examples include the gardens at our elementary schools, the outdoor classroom at CMS, and the heating and cooling systems that are reported on at the high school. We also have um, practices and procedures for uh, what we do at the at each of the schools, elementary, middle, and high school. So if they're uh, recycling, using uh, recycling bins and so forth, those are practices that we teach. It's part of the taught curriculum. But what we're talking about today is our actual formal curriculum on how students learn about sustainability. So it's part of our science curriculum. Next slide. So in 2016, um, the Next Generation Science Standards came out. These were huge national um, work and they included um, sustainability as part of that. Um, and then Massachusetts took them and kind of narrowed them down for our own purposes. So we have a Massachusetts curriculum framework in science. Um, and all these folks were on that committee. Uh, so I think 14, 14 of us worked to adapt. How are we gonna take what we were currently doing at that time in Concord and make it work for um, with these science standards and sustainability was a huge part of that. So there are four strands in the science, life science, physical science, technology and engineering and earth and space science. So sustainability comes under that last one, earth and space science. And there's actually a strand called earth and human activity. And that's where sustainability lives in our curriculum. So it is an assessed uh, standard, meaning kids take uh, MCAS in science in fifth, eighth, and then 10th grade. And so it's, it is assessed in our curriculum. Next slide. So we're gonna talk tonight, uh, essentially about five levels about how it's taught. So uh, sustainability is the precursors for it are taught in preschool to grade three. We hit it hard in our curriculum in grades four and five. And I think you saw Kim Rivers class come in and do some about the water cycle and so forth. That was what this is. Um, the middle school, grade six through eight, Carrie will talk about, and then Michael finish us out with the high school. Um, and you know that we redesign entirely our ninth grade curriculum to be called Planet Earth. So that's what this is about. So we're gonna start with uh, elementary. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Allison Forsetter, and I am the Elementary Curriculum Coordinator, which is a new role this year, and I also teach in the STEAM Lab over at Ripley. Um, some of you may know me. I taught at Alcott for the past um, eight or nine years as well, but I'm excited um, to share some of the work that's happening um, across the schools with you today. Um, this first slide shows what's happening for pre-K through three, sort of at a macro view. Um, the small type at the top is about that we use the full option science system, which is the FOSS curriculum. Uh, we adopted that in part um, with the outrolling of the next gen standards. So while we felt Concord was hitting some of those in some ways with our homegrown curriculum, we really felt we needed to go more in depth, particularly in physical science and earth science. And so FOSS was a good fit. Um, it's an inquiry based curriculum. Um, the students are taught to use science notebooks to make observations, make hypotheses, collect data. Um, and FOSS is designed around a developmental progression. And it actually continues through elementary school into the middle school, which Carrie will mention um, as well. So um, at the bottom of each slide uh, for all of us in green will be the standards that come from Massachusetts that we're referring to. So for example, at the bottom of this slide uh, for preschool through second grade students, um, one of the standards is that they observe and discuss the impact of people's activities on the local environment. And you can see, for example, that comes up in air and weather, tree and weather, water and climate. Um, and some of the units like that. Erin, you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll speak about K through uh, three first. Um, as Kristen mentioned, in um, the earliest years for our youngest learners, we're really sort of setting the stage for them to, as they learn to think as scientists um, and researchers and environmentalists. Um, and we're really trying to give them the skills that they need to hit that deeper content that starts in fourth grade. Um, so for example, if you look at kindergarten, they spend a lot of time studying trees. There's a whole unit called schoolyard trees trees. They really familiarize yourself with the natural resources that trees provide um, that are part of their everyday environment. Um, they have worked to explore their neighborhood and town and city trees um, at home. Uh, and we also take a field trip to Landsake Farm in Weston, um, which is a wonderful place for them to use all their five senses to explore the sustainable practices and renewable resources um, and responsible farming that's happening around us. Um, most grade levels, uh, K1 and 2 in particular, but on up through the grades, study the life cycle of something. Um, so plants and insects, um, for example, and we talk about how, and the students are taught how creatures need certain things to survive. And that may be water, that may be uh, fresh air, but it has to do as they get older with temperature um, and things like that. So those are all things where we teach about how our human impact impacts those around us and, and we can have a positive um, impact on that through some sustainability practices. In second grade, part of the social studies science overlap is they look at resource maps. So they talk about you know, natural resources that are present here in New England, as well as in other parts of the country and the globe, and also how those have changed over time. Um, and it really, almost previews a little bit of what's coming up in grades three and four, where they talk about renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. Uh, grade three does begin a water and climate unit. Um, it talks about how, um, you know, there are different ways that human activity impacts sustainability or has an impact um, or around sustainability that would protect different kinds of wetlands, for example, where if you protect your wetlands and support the creatures and plant life that lives there, you may reduce floods, you know. Um, and so I think having students be familiar with their particular area, um, right here in Concord, we have lots of examples um, of places where conservation efforts um, have really supported our own sustainable practices. And uh, like we said, the bottom box there talks about how now moving into grades four and five, we really get more specific and more concrete in some of the content. Erin, you can go to the next slide. So in grade four, um, all three units, uh, physical science, earth science, and life science, all hit um, uh, in areas that could be reflective of sustainable practices and understanding um, our impact on the environment. So energy conservation, alternative source of energy, renewable versus non-renewable sources, um, different kinds of fuel that are used in different parts of the country as well as or in the world. Um, what, are what are students' experiences with wind turbines or solar panels, things like that, um, and have an awareness 
awareness of sort of the technology that's coming around in their lifetime um, that can make a difference. Uh, we also, there's a little picture up there of our Blandings turtles. I had to mention our hatch program. Um, the fourth graders here in Concord for the past almost 20 years have been head starting turtles. Um, and a lot of what they learn about um, is why it's so important for us to give them a head start because it is such a harsh world out there, right? The air, temp the air quality, the water quality, the temperature really determines their survival. And so the students learn how to maintain that in the classroom so that when they're hardy enough, they can be released. And so for any of you that have had fourth graders. Um, it's really a beloved program that the kids really take ownership of, um, and they will actually be releasing all their turtles um, in the next three or four weeks. Erin, you can go to the next slide. So um, the last grade that I'll talk about is fifth grade. Um, and you can just see from the denseness of this slide that the content really does pick up. Um, in fifth grade, it's particularly in their earth and sun units, they talk about how all um, these things, all these different interconnected elements they've learned about are coming together. So all parts of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, energy transfer, um, climate, wet, climate change, ocean currents, all those things work together to sort of provide the environment that we're in and our impact on it. Um, there are some really wonderful hands-on experiences the kids get throughout fifth grade, um, particularly around um, water. And so they learn about, you know, so the, the next level of the water cycle, particularly our watershed here in Massachusetts. And so we are in the process of planning a boat trip where they go up uh, near Plum Island and they get to go on a floating lab trip. This year, Kristen and I will be attending several of these. <laughs> Um, and they really get to do some, as we would say, real science, you know, taking measurements, um, making calculations, making observations, getting their hands not just dirty, but wet in this case. Um, and they really get to put together what they've been talking about in the classroom with what they can see from erosion um, and wastewater and organisms and sort of that estuary, all of those things that come together for them on this trip, um, which is really exciting. In January, we had a visit from the Concord Public Works where they talked about how water is processed here in town. Um, and it really made the students think about, you know, when you hear the water main breaks, you know, or something like that, how does that impact it? What sort of emergency protocols are in place? They had a wonderful uh, storm water model where they actually poured in dyed water and we got to see it sort of go into the different layers and how it gets filtered out. So that was really great and really helped students understand that, you know, their whole lives they've been told, you know, don't take a long shower and turn off the water when you brush your teeth. But we talk about about why, right, and what kind of water reserves we have. Um, and then there's also a picture of something they do um, when they come to the STEAM lab, which is they develop um, a prototype that's powered by um, a codable robot that can sweep up floating trash um, out of like the Assabet or Sudbury River, sort of to mimic some of the really amazing things that are happening uh, globally around cleaning up the Pacific garbage patch and things like that, but really trying to bring it home to them that their ideas and their creativity are really going to make the difference. Uh, the last slide for me, Erin. So the last one are all the science standard or many of the science standards that come um, up for grade five. Um, and Kristen has highlighted the ones in green um, that per particularly pertain to sustainability. So this one, um, obtain and combine information about ways communities reduce human impact on Earth's resources and environment by changing an agricultural, industrial, or community practice or process. For example, treating sewage, reducing the amounts of materials used, capturing polluting emissions from factories or power plants, preventing runoff from agricultural activities. Um, so that's a really sort of big standard. And I think what really is amazing is I've learned so much from listening to Carrie and Mike about how they learn this content in fifth grade and they really get a chance to practice it um, as they move up through the rest of their years in Concord. So I'll hand it over to Carrie. Thanks so much. So yeah, that's uh, thank you very much. Um, for people that don't know me, I'm Carrie Bjerke. I'm teaching sixth grade science this year and I'm head of the science, technology and engineering department at the middle school. And as Allison said, it's been such a pleasure doing these presentations because we get to hear what's happening at all the other levels that we may not necessarily have known. So in third grade, they're looking at maps of mineral resources and, and other fossil fuel resources. And then in sixth grade, the Earth History Unit cycles back around and we talk about 
you know, how Earth's history and plate tectonics formed a lot of those fossil fuel resources, where they were formed, and then where they are currently and how the distribution became what it is today and why they are perhaps not being made any longer. And we need to think about these things as finite resources. Um, so that takes place during our Earth History Unit. In our Diversity of Life Unit in the sixth grade, we really focus a lot on the interconnectedness that Allison spoke about. But in this case, we're talking a little more about the interconnectedness between the various spheres and the life within those spheres. So they're introduced to the concept of biodiversity. They look particular at the coevolution of pollinators and plants and the impact that losing either the pollinators or the plants have both on the entire ecosystem, but also on their dinner table and what they're used to eating and what we would see in our stores. So we try to bring that home to them on a more personal level. Sixth graders at the end of the year, I'll choose a topic that came up for them and resonated for them at some point in the year to take a deep dive into. We call it their personal passion project or their P-cubed. And many, many of the students end up choosing topics related to climate change or sustainability. Um, this picture on the lower right of the slide shows a three-dimensional model of the global seed vault built from popsicle sticks that a couple of our students did last year. They were really intrigued by this concept of collecting seeds from all the different plants in the world and putting them in Svalbard, Norway, where they can stay frozen and not impacted by global climate change, even were like power to be lost to that to particular area. They were very excited by that. Um, next slide, please. In the seventh grade, each of our units really has a uh, culminating project that has a sustainability theme. And the focus in seventh grade is much more on human impact as well as use of human technology to mitigate the impacts that uh, we are seeing within the environment. In their, uh, I'll start with their weather and water unit. They have a project called Build a Better Bus Stop, which is really a passive solar and insulation engineering challenge project. And you can see the bus stop in the upper right sitting out in the snow. We actually take them out in the snow and, the, and see how well they stay insulated and how warm they keep the passengers as they're waiting for the bus. Uh, they also have a particular climate change passion project that they do at the end of that unit as well, where they look, because really the entire unit, how can you study weather and water without talking about climate change? So students, again, think of some strand that really resonated with them and they research that and present it in sort of a science fair forum uh, to, to their class and then also to other classes. Uh, in their energy and electromagnetic force unit, we come back around to the concept of renewable energy sources and non-renewable energy sources that they touched on in elementary school. In this case, they're using their knowledge of circuits to actually build simulations of different energy shacks that are being lit up by motors that they hook through simulated uh, power generation stations. So on the left hand side of the slide, if you look closely, you can see a wind turbine and inside the little house, you can even see a light bulb lit up. And this particular group obviously was looking at the benefits of wind power. They break them down uh, using all sorts of different analysis and statistics to show the efficiency of the different power uh, platform and then all of these projects are set up in what we call energy city and then the students tour and the different areas of energy city looking at the different types of power that are being simulated and then they are pretending that they're mayor of a town trying to decide on how that town will uh, produce energy for their population and so they have to vote on what they think is the best to use and they have to take into account the economics and the pollution and the feasibility of each of these different kinds of power when they do that. And lastly, their populations and ecosystem unit, oh, nope, I'm still back on the other slide, sorry. <laughs> their populations and ecosystem unit has what's called the eco scenario project at the end where students are actually looking at different design solutions to protect a particular ecosystem. 
and they have to evaluate them and make a recommendation. And all of these different ecosystems are either national parks or part of the part of the National Forest Service. So that's seventh grade. It's full of all sorts of exciting sustainability things. Next slide now. Um, in eighth grade, it's all a lot more about critical thinking in general about the role of science in this interplay between humans and the environment and sustainability. So they talk about better living through chemistry topics, right, you know, from the burning of fossil fuels to making plastics to um, the, you know, aerosol spray cans, things that contribute to ozone depletion and acid rain. They can now understand the chemistry behind these things and think a little more deeply about how much better the life is that we're creating through a lot of these technological innovations. In their planetary science unit, they talk about the runaway greenhouse effect that on Venus and compare and contrast that with what is going on here on Earth. They also talk about tidal power as another possible alternate uh, energy generation technique. And then in the heredity and adaptation unit, they get into talking about shifts in populations over time selective breeding, genetic engineering, and all of the moral interplay that comes about with issues like that. And these ideas of humans trying to clean up scientifically messes that they have made previously scientifically, um, sort of a spiral effect. Next slide. Um, an exciting new thing that we're able to do now that we're offering enrichment at all three grade levels is we are able to sort of dive a little deeper into issues like sustainability and one enrichment being offered this year at both the seventh and the eighth grade levels called ponds, pools and produce and Tara Fernandez Davila is uh, overseeing that. And she takes students out to our local wetlands, um, Dugan Brook, the vernal pools that are along the bike trail. And students are doing field studies on the water, on the soil, they're surveying plants, they are bringing stuff back and looking them under the microscopes. And this winter, when things got a little cold for that, we luckily were, had these grow racks come in that were made possible by a Concord Ed Fund grant. And so they have started growing and harvesting food within the classrooms, in both the science classrooms and in the facts classrooms. And so that has been a really interesting uh, contribution to the whole concept of sustainability within our science curriculum and our facts curriculum, which has been really neat. So that's what we've got going on in the middle school. All right, good, uh, good evening. All right, so um, it really is really wonderful to hear what other folks are saying. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like, yes, we certainly revisit the topics K-8 and, you know, when we, you know, we provide sort of a more complex examination of them, but to see them introduced so early and, and to see this common theme of sort of self-reflection you know, local community, and then finally global community, along with all these sort of skills wrapped in. It's really, it's, this is sort of the second time we've done this and it's really uh, amazing to hear it. Um, so as Kristen said earlier, you know, grade nine, we did a com not a complete revamp, but definitely a, uh, you know, rename of the course to Planet Earth um, and put in a huge, huge chunk on sustainability. Um, and you can see those are the, our state standards um, that go along with those. And yeah, I mean, there's just a huge piece on earth and human activity, right? And earth systems and our impact on those. So um, uh, next slide. Uh, so these are some really kind of cool examples of what we're doing in grade nine. Um, again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, sort of the self-reflection piece, sort of new year, greener you, um, you know, that's sort of an activity around, you know, sure ecological footprint, a little bit on recycling, uh, renewable energies, but also what's kind of interesting is the guidelines and restrictions of each of our three communities, Concord, Carlisle, Boston, and you know, also sort of a, an activism piece where there are ways to get involved um, on that same website. You know, along with that sort of self-reflection is this green pledge, um, which is kind of self-explanatory. And then we sort of go into this idea of land use. And, and for the most part, that's pretty um, surprising to students because 
you know, I don't know, but most students feel like, you know, urban areas, for example, cities, you know, they think that's a much higher percentage of our total land use, and it's only around 3%. What they're surprised about is sort of the grassland, pasture, and range, you know, for cattle and, and, and things like that is all the way up to 26%. So it, it's kind of an eye opener in, the, opener in the sense that then you start to get into diet and, you know, and, and omnivore, carnivore, and, you know, vegetarian and how that sort of impacts um, what we use our land for and what we have to use our land for, you know, currently. Um, after we kind of get out of that self, oh, and then Ed Puzzle's sort of how recycling works, that's kind of a deeper dive into, okay, so you've thrown it in the recycling bin, you know, now what happens to it? You know, how, does it get repurposed? How do, what are the next steps? And how does it turn into something that's either repurposed um, or, you know, what happens next? Um, in terms of the understanding of the greenhouse and so on and so forth, you know, you know, what will climate change change? That's sort of a deeper dive into, yes, the temperature of the earth is gonna get warmer, but what, are, what is that going to then impact, you know? And, and we start to do, students start to do some really good research and begin to really evaluate resources. And they start to research things like, what will do the food supply, drinking water, drinking quality, drinking water quality, droughts, disease, et cetera. So it's sort of, again, it's a bigger, it's a bigger sort of, um, it's, a, it's a the next step. And then finally, what we just plastic. Um, and then what we try to do is we look at um, the latest articles um, and the latest research, and that's what that IPCC article is. Uh, it stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Curriculum on Climate Change. So again, evaluation of resources. And then we're starting to get into the idea of um, formulating um, competitive sort of formulating um, arguments. The last thing that I think is really great, which is sort of our capstone project in ninth grade, at least for this unit, is sort of de debunking the climate den the denier myth. So there are 10 myths um, and students are expected to conduct research, um, work on presentation skills and then present. Um, and again, making a compelling argument. In this case, the teacher is acting as the climate change skeptic and they have to then um, convince uh, convince the teacher that uh, in the class for that matter that um, it is indeed a myth. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, as we move through grades 10, 11, and 12, biology sort of is next in, in sustainability and biology is really touched upon primarily in the ecology unit. Um, you know, we're talking about organisms, populations, and their effect on their environment and really sort of, um, you know, the carrying capacity of the environment as it relates to our different, the, you know, populations and different types of human diets, et cetera. So clearly there were, were sort of strains on those ecosystems. And that's when we bring in things like, uh, we actually have hydroponics in our biology classrooms. We also do the, the sort of the Blandings turtles. Um, we raise the, there are threatened species as was mentioned earlier. So we have sort of environmental stewardship piece to that. We are also uh, composting in the biology classrooms, not just the cafeteria. Um, and then we also talk about invasive species like uh, the bittersweet that is in the Northeast that is native to um, uh, Asia. So that's primarily biology. As was alluded to in chemistry, we talk more of sort of the better living through chemistry and sort of the how does how do we turn um, a non-renewable source of energy into usable energy? And the same thing goes for fossil fuels, et cetera. Um, next, please. And, and lastly, um, we have approximately 105 students uh, who are taking AP Environmental Science. And that's a course that was developed, I want to say maybe four or five years ago. Um, uh, and you see those standards are, are, are sort of the AP standards. And you can see they're very rich. The curriculum is very rich with these with the sustainability pieces as well. Um, and, uh, oh, next slide, please. And here are some examples of some of the projects or uh, activities that we do there. Again, we start with sort of self-reflection. The sustainable plate is a very cool little uh, activity where you take a recipe, the dinner that you had last night, 
pick apart the ingredients, um, figure out where it was all sourced from, figure out what the environmental impacts of all the ingredients are, and try to figure out a way to uh, make it less impactful or maybe do a substitute in uh, for some of the ingredients and still keeping it as uh, delicious as it was before. Um, ecological footprint calculation and uh, water chart use, similar to what you, you, you might expect. Uh, the personal waste audit is a uh, very, it's, it's a very, very cool activity where uh, students are expected to wear um, anything that is non-recyclable that they use throughout the day uh, in terms of meals. So you'll see Just students with sort of Sorrento's <laughs> bags around their necks um, or whatever else they, you know, and, and it really does it's not just a public shaming or anything like that, but it is it is sort of like in your face and making you realize just how much waste you generated every single meal throughout the day. Um, so that one's pretty, that's pretty comical. Um, and then uh, there's two other things I want to talk about, the clear cutting debate. Um, and, and this was sort of mentioned earlier around, you know, what are the impacts of doing certain things, right? So the economic versus ecological factors that go into clear cutting, right? You know, why is it done? You know, obviously you're doing, you're destroying the forest biome, but perhaps it's done for farming or for cattle. And so there's an economic piece that is maybe a little more complicated than just, hey, we shouldn't be, you know, clear cutting. Um, uh, and then lastly, one of the, the, the developing sustainable energy infrastructure project, which is in development, that kind of got fast tracked because of the war in Ukraine. Um, and so students are now assigned um, a region of the world um, there to create an energy profile, an existing energy profile. And then they're challenged to then look at different energy options based on their geographic location and try to create a sustainable, sustainable energy independence. And so again, that Ukraine kind of war kind of put it front and center with um, reliance um, for other countries and other countries for our, our energy needs. So it also gives a really good example of how different countries are sort of doing it compared to the United States um, and what their energy profiles look like. So uh, that is sort of a, that in a nutshell of what we're doing up at the high school. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Great. So uh, one thing, Mike, if you could just talk about how unusual it is to have our earth science course as our ninth grade course. Most other districts have a biology course, a physics course, something else. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, the truth is it, it really just, it flows just so naturally from sort of the, the, the different goals, the goals that the, the towns have around sustainability. You know, you know, some of our best science teachers or teachers in the building are earth science teachers. Um, obviously, you know, the folks that have been there the longest, Ray Pavlik and obviously Peter Nickel, you know, it's really, it's, it's been, it was a really great decision in my part, on, on, in my opinion, to sort of make that sort of a mandatory course. Um, and Kristen's right, um, you know, sometimes you'll get like a physics first sort of watered down version of physics um, or they'll jump right in with biology um, but you know, we as a department and, 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 and as, a, as a society, I really commend the, the towns uh, around gee, identifying, in my opinion, maybe one of the most important courses for you know, citizens. Um, so yeah, it, Kristen's 100% correct that um, you know, Acton Boxborough does it, Lexington still does it, but it, it's, uh, for the most part, you sort of see it end in eighth grade, um, and it's a shame. Um, so yeah, it, it's really been quite nice to sort of have it actually grow stronger. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the other thing that I would mention is that, you know, the the ninth grade academy was sort of generated during 2020 during hybrid, and one of the goals that we have in there is sort of this interdisciplinary piece. And we're just starting to see how that's going to kind of really flow nicely and, and field trips and things like that. So all of that is really exciting and um, on the horizon. So that's definitely something we're excited about. 
Thank you so much. And thanks to Allison and Carrie. I can see you guys both on there. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. Great. Thank, thank you. This is, this is so exciting. It's, uh, rich. It's, it's rich. It's wonderful to see the interplay of, you know, how the, the curriculum reflects and reinforces the community values. Um, I think that's really neat. And you know, as was just mentioned about how it just grows stronger, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. Um, I think that there are any questions, comments? Well, I want to commend our educators for weaving so much decision making student decision making capacity into science yeah. i think that probably distinguishes concord and concord carlisle um, and i think we we live in an era where that's rather critical um, my my question for uh carrie and allison and, and mike is uh, a one where I'm going to ask you just to generally characterize how students are doing vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Uh, you're trying to teach, you're trying to empower. Um, and I'm curious, uh, is there a growing level of, uh, of anxiety that they're dealing with? I know many adults are. I'm not sure about our kids. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you encounter that? What does it look or sound or feel Mike, like? Mike, do you want to talk about that? I think you're the most clearly. Uh, yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I, I would say that it's definitely, it's, it's top of mind, right? Uh, I mean, they definitely are feeling the same sort of stress and anxiety that we as adults are. Uh, I, one of the things that feels different, which is encouraging is the level of activism that I'm seeing in the last sort of couple of years. Um, I, I think you see it with some of the presentations you saw, for example, on Spectrum and things like that. Like there is this level of activism and, and sort of taking control um, that I didn't see maybe four or five years ago. Um, I do see the anxiety, but there isn't this complacency. There is this urge to sort of lead and act. And I think that's really encouraging. Yeah, I think Patricia Guiney at our last sustainability committee meeting said that there were over 100 high school students on the green team and the sunrise movement. So that that was a number I was shocked by because it, it risen so much. Carrie, do you have something to add about the middle school? Um, I did. I did just want to touch on I think that, you know, part of what we're trying to show students, certainly at the middle school level and the high school level is that understanding the science behind a lot of this gives them a lot of personal power. It gives them power to make choices about their lifestyle. It gives them power to influence their family's lifestyle. Um, and it gives them power as they become voters to make choices that are going to make really significant changes. And by teaching them the science behind it and the facts behind it and to look for evidence and to not just believe everything that they hear or everything they read, but like, show me what's the evidence? Well, where's the data on that? Um, don't jump to conclusions. Let's, let's take a deeper dive. We're giving them sort of those critical thinking skills to not be helpless about something as anxiety provoking as climate change, but to think, what can I do? And what can my knowledge get other people to do um, to tackle these problems? because so much of what we also teach them is like, there are alternatives. Um, technology can do a lot to mitigate some of the impacts and to slowly cause the earth to heal. And those are the skills and critical thinking that I think we're really trying to leave the students with. And I feel a lot of them come in initially with a lot of anxiety. And as they look at the evidence and weigh the options, um, their anxiety almost calms down a little bit. At least I hope. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's more than encouraging. Thank <laughs> yes. you. What I always note with you guys, I don't have a question. Um, Alex, can you really speak into the mic? I'm Our the worst. audience is having a hard sure. time hearing us. Um, nice. One of the things that I always note with you all is, and you can see it in this presentation and in so many others, is how developmentally appropriate of how the how you guys approach science what that looks like for a kindergartner 
and how very different it looks in high school. And I just, I more than just anything wanted to remark on it that I see that so consistently in all of our presentations and how being so appropriate and making it, you know, inquisitive and curious for little kids, but thoughtful and meaningful. The court's um, sort of question, like addressing perhaps anxiety as, as, as older children understand this, I think it, it, it speaks to why our curriculum is so effective. Um, and I just, I think it's wonderful. So not a question, just a love it. observation. It's the secret sauce of what we're yeah, doing. Yeah, really though. Thank you. Yeah. It shows. Well done, Allison, Carrie, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Okay. So we're back to additional uh, public comments. If you are in the live with us, please raise your hands. We like to give people here who are here in person an opportunity first. Seeing none, I will open up uh, public comment to, to our remote participants. If there's anybody who has a comment to make, please use the participants, the raise hand feature. Um, the bottom of Zoom or turn on your video. Uh, can I, I'm seeing none. No. Okay. Oh, no. nope. <laughs> Someone left. <laughs> okay. Um, and so with that, we will move on to our action item. Uh, I think we only have the one, the vote to approve the transportation contract. Yes. Do you want to read it or? I sent you over the uh, the motion. Correct. Yep. But I can I can start. Um, yep. So um, we had uh, a few sessions with the transportation department regarding um, their contract. Um, we've come to a tentative agreement, a three year contract. Uh, the details are in the memo. Um, it was uh, they were great. Um, it was very respectful, um, and we we really really value them. Uh, and especially after last year, them taking a one-year contract. And if you guys are in there. They were great to work with yeah. and very straightforward and um, just easy, all, yeah. all, all, you know, really compelling and they thoughtful do. engagement. Really important and good work. So. <laughs> and I think uh, your colleagues want to thank you, the folks on the team for working with Absolutely. Jared and uh, his team on, on this with our transportation workers. I think we all know how uh, critical they are to uh, the, the wellness and the safety of our, of our kids. Thank you for all the yes. effort you put in. Well, Carrie, do you have that motion? I do. You? Yeah. So, any any questions or comments? No. Nothing. Okay. I think so we'll do this in two separate votes. Am I correct for the two committees? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's two on there. Yep. Very good. So the motion, uh, we move that the Concord Public School Committee vote to approve the Concord Carlisle Support Staff Association MTA Bus Drivers Unit three-year successor agreement for the period of 20, 2022 to 2025. I'll second that. And all in favor? Any more discussion? No? Okay. All in favor for Concord? Aye. 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 Great. Right. Passed unanimously. All right. Can we have a motion for the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee's uh, vote? Sure. Move that the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee vote to approve the Concord Carlisle Support Staff Association MTA Bus Drivers Unit three year successor agreement for the period of 2022 to 2025. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? I just want to note that, I mean, and I experienced it again today. If you drive through Concord ever, you most likely encounter a bus at some point. And, and it is not uncommon to see an act of kindness or a courtesy extended to a, to a child, a family, a fellow driver. Um, and I always just find it remarkable of how, how attentive and aware of everything our transportation team really mm -hmm. seems. It's 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 just always impressive yes um, yep so that's my only comment in the discussion uh yeah. and and thank you to the bargaining team and yes. and to you know everybody um okay so may i just add yeah, yeah we were so lucky that we had buses running through the pandemic and all throughout 
that has not been the case everywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. thank you so much for, for supporting our kids and families and, yes. and showing up. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Hi. Aye. Aye. Yes. <laughs> Passes unanimously. Aye. And with that, I will accept a motion to adjourn the regional part of this uh, meeting. So no. moved. <laughs> Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So Thank you. School committee, you just want to push on through? Or yeah, do you need to right? have five? Sure. Absolutely. I just want to check it. Packard School Committee is resuming. And our first item is an update on the middle school building project. Who wants to take that one? Uh, I could get started and say that the design subcommittee met immediately before the school vacation week, uh, and we saw some updates, basically a, uh, a bit of a dry run on some of the refinements, no, no changes of substance, um, and uh, that same presentation will be brought to the full middle school building committee this uh, Thursday morning. It's a remote meeting, a public meeting, 7.30 a.m. I gotta add to that, Mr. Cameron and I have spent probably 12 to 15 hours with the design team and various groups of uh, faculty, staff, and other school personnel coming through as they're getting feedback on the progress of the designs. So it's been, um, it's fun. There are some meetings I can highly engage with and others like the today one today, which was all facilities and all the infrastructure and uh, clearly Russ and his team needed to be there. So uh, it's really starting to come together. We're seeing details start to, to form, which will certainly be shared Thursday at whatever level they're ready. And um, a lot of great work going on. A lot of great energy around the work too. And the full committee meets this Thursday? This Thursday. At Thursday. Yeah. Okay. And you're still remote, I presume? We are remote. We're, so we're still remote. And uh, I guess we could add just for the audience that uh, the design team not only is uh, the SMMA firm, but the many firms they in turn engage, yep. uh, including not a few uh, experts on uh, educational facility work. Right. And there's other works going on. I should even mention tonight, the Board of Health was reviewing preliminary uh, plans for the septic system. So SMMA and niche engineering are, are there tonight. So there's work pretty constantly going mm. on and a lot of great support from the town leadership and different departments. And we're really moving forward. Great. And let's see, we're down to the CPS capital plan. So I'll jump in, I, I guess, if that's a good starting point. Sure. Um, you've looked at this plan multiple times. We didn't even attach it It's uh, on previous agendas and, mm -hmm. and such. Uh, I think we've had a lot of discussion and feedback from the community about the plan to replace the boiler at Alcott with a higher efficiency boiler. Um, and uh, my recommendation after hearing that feedback, hearing your conversations, knowing we've had other needs come up, is to relook at that $350,000 um, and reallocate it, at least for FY23. Mm -hmm. In the work being done here at Ripley with the Green Communities Grant uh, of 125,000 ish, ish, which is a matching grant. We've realized in the preliminary engineering work to accept the grant to put heat pumps in here, we have three to $400,000 of electrical upgrades to do. So to swap, you would have to fund that in FY24 to not lose access to the Green Communities Grant. So my recommendation tonight would be to uh, reallocate the 350,000 in FY23 to 300,000 for Ripley and a $50,000 item to do the study work to answer all these questions that uh, I think you have about and the community has about electric and the elementary schools and get some better information um, as to viability and cost and all of those pieces we don't have at this point. Mm -hmm. So that is my recommendation. Um, I personally would encourage you to consider voting that tonight so we are squared away before town meeting on Sunday. Just a question. Um, perhaps we could just focus on Alcott, looking at Alcott in terms of that. Yeah, I think we could talk on the yeah. scope of the work yeah. once we 
Okay, get that more, yeah. get closer to it. Sure. Um, hmm. I'm just trying to think of the language. We can think about the language, certainly. I, I want to applaud you for uh, revisiting this. Um, I want to applaud all the uh, the voices we've heard. Um, I think it's been difficult for us because we've had a project in progress. Mm -hmm. And so to interrupt anything like that, that's uh, been thought through once and has to be thought through again in uh, a rapidly changing set of circumstances is uh, not easy, and nor is it uh, something that is uh, fiscally um, uh, an easy reach for us. Um, my The hope I'm holding out uh, is that the work will uh, benefit us in terms of what might ultimately come our way with the other two elementaries, because their life cycle follows the Alcott life cycle. So perhaps that's where we get some economy and efficiency that we're, we're losing now. We might gain it later on. I hope that's a, a reasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. We'll see, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it is reasonable, but you know, we're, we have to look at alternatives. And you know, we might end back up where we were. <laughs> that's possible. I think that's a realistic outcome, right. but, but I understand that time needs to be built in to factor that in. Right. Okay. Um, so we'll say we'll uh, modify the FY23 capital plan to reallocate 300,000 to Ripley electrical upgrades mm -hmm. for the P pumps. Is that? Yeah, yeah it's the right? upgrades. Your source pumps. Um, it's the electrical infrastructure that we're up to facility now. now. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's understandable. And then $50,000 for a study, shall we say, of the. Um, alternatives or we'll figure that out right okay does the <laughs> district uh on the town meeting approval of that uh final final uh set of numbers um allow the administration to move any of the unused 50 over to the 300 you could that's within your yeah, purview within, we could bring it back to you yeah, to yeah because, do that formally. because i think we've heard from folks i i'm not qualified to say but uh fifty thousand dollars is probably a very uh what a very safe number such that you might have money to move back right. toward toward ripley yeah, i think you could revoke that allocation okay. just so people know that that might well be coming our mm -hmm. way Okay. Or you could use it. So the, uh, the studies for the elementary schools. So you could technically, if there's any money left over, you could apply it to That's other um, uh, projects that are at the elementary schools. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We could discuss that this summer. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you want to make a motion? I so, <laughs> so, so this basically takes uh, uh, just a couple of line items in an earlier table and moves them. It's, Simple as that. Well, Great. you don't have any allocation now for Alcott's needs because we're absorbing it in an unknown need. So you're you're going to have to relook at the five year plan yes. right. once you have some but information. But for tonight's yeah. purposes, yeah, for FY twenty three, it, right. it works. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to try to make a motion? I, I try. So, so I move that uh, the. Well, I'm going to try. Let me just yes. draft something. Let Go. me just draft yep. something that the uh, Concord Public Schools uh, capital plan uh, be amended such that uh, $50,000, up to $50,000, be allocated or devoted to whatever language we want, uh, a uh, study for alternative, help me out here, uh, energy approaches, mm -hmm. pretty general, but gets us That's there. That's probably best. Actually. Yeah. Probably yeah. best. Uh, alternative energy approaches and $300,000 be uh, uh, allocated to uh, toward, mm -hmm. toward the Ripley upgrades that are uh, required for subsequent green community initiatives and heat source pump installations uh, okay. fy24 and that the uh, finally that there has to be a reference to that these are changes in the 2023 
multi-year table that right. we yeah. considered. Can we work FY with language like all. that? So I, I think we've got that, yeah. And Aaron can grab it to put it to paper for me. Okay. <laughs> and you're obviously gonna modify the slides. Yeah, he's I'm gonna send gonna them even tonight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think if that's the important thing. And then well, don't think you need to modify the motion. That doesn't get that specific. No. 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 Uh, it doesn't. Nope, it does not. Okay. We'll check with Carmen though. Okay. She's been back and forth with us all day on the slides. So do people feel comfortable with what we've just gone through in terms of taking a vote, or do we need to make something more concise or cleaner? So I think what we're hearing very clearly is uh, uh, this is no guarantee, this is no panacea, no. This, uh, but this is information that uh, is, uh, should this pass, is uh, mm -hmm. information we believe is uh, timely now. And we have to invest accordingly. Mm -hmm. Okay, ready to vote? Yes. Um, if that was sufficient as a motion, we'd need a second. Oh yes. If you want second. me to, if you want me to have another go at it, wish me luck. <laughs> second. Okay. Thank okay. You. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Then we have one more uh, vote to surplus deaths. I don't have the motion. Yeah. Um, so just a little background. Uh, must have been about a year and a half ago uh, on the business managers listserv, Newton Public Schools was giving away a number of surplus desks. Um, we took approximately 310 of them at the time. It was a lifesaver because of the cost of all of the furniture, probably saved us 80, 100 grand. Um, but at this time, uh, we don't need them. Um, some of them have uh, are past their useful life. So the, the, <laughs> they were when we took them from well, Newton. Is that the truth? It's all sustainability. That's why they surplus them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were a lifesaver. So, yeah. um, so we're deeming them surplus, um, and then um, they're taking up a lot of space mm. that we need uh, right now. Um, and then, if if you do so, vote it. I will try and find them another home. Okay. Yeah, we're, they may be past our useful life. We're not convinced that they're past useful mm -hmm. life of some mm -hmm. other space yeah. and mm -hmm. district. So we'll try to donate. Maybe them. Newton will take them back. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> they practically paid us yeah, to take them. <laughs> Very sustainable. Yeah, we're we're still working. All right. Does anybody have the language? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aaron, do you want to pull it up? I've got it here. If you want, Jared. There you go, it's on the screen. I move that the Concord School Committee uh, declare 310 elementary school desks located at the Alcott door on Willard Elementary Schools as surplus supplies. I will second that. Any discussion? Thank Anybody you. want a desk? <laughs> no, we can't do that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that's our final item, I think. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Can I say clarification on Thursday night? Oh. Do we have a, a, there are meetings that we're going to Thursday night or not? Oh, that's a good question. We'll so we have been asked to attend the CSEC <laughs> meeting. Uh, so I am on their agenda. We are, I shouldn't look at Jared because it'll be Russ probably with me. Um, we're on their agenda to answer a number of questions about the boilers and other ways we approach capital relative to sustainability. So we've agreed to come and share what we can in a week where we're juggling two town meetings and a whole lot of other things. So we're, we're okay to go and do the best we can and say we'll come back with more information if we don't have everything pulled together. It seemed like Ian was doing pretty well at having some things okay. at his fingertips today. Um, okay. So we're happy to open really the conversation. Week week, I'm yeah, I'm out every yeah. night this weekend, right. Sunday. So, I, Sunday. Um, so I that one's a Zoom, so I'll do it from okay. there. But. Uh, it will, we'll start the conversation. They called a special meeting and we don't want to. Okay. And do any of us have to be there? I didn't post. We didn't post. We can all go. We just yeah. get to liberate. Right. right. Yeah. I, I think to, some school committee deliberate. presence right. would make a lot of sense. It's your capital mm -hmm. plan they're asking mm -hmm. questions yeah. about and process. And mm -hmm. it and is on such. Zoom. And yeah, I definitely okay. will attend. And we've received that Zoom link. It's I believe it was linked to the email I forwarded you I last think it's on the town night. Website as well. But let me know. Okay. No. Yeah. Wonderful presentations tonight. Yes. Really, really superb. Yep. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Yes. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Oh. Oh. Yeah, oh, I thought we. Oh, we <laughs> you, you threw me off with that the question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, motion to adjourn. So Second. Second. All right. All in favor. Yep. All right. Aye. Okay. Now can we go? Yes. <laughs> thank you. You are released. Yeah, thank, you, Mark. Mark. thank you, Mark. Have a great night.